I'm lost in there because there were so many which ways it went. So to relieve your anxiety at the moment, a, a small diversion. There was a woman who went to New York City. She did not live there, but she was leaving to uh, go on a European trip. And so uh, she wanted a loan to pay for this trip. And she went to a bank and she proposed, she asked if she could borrow $5,000 for her trip. Well, the officer of the bank said, well, a ma'am will need some sort of security to, uh, to uh, give you this kind of loan. And she said, no, no, no problem, not a problem. I'm going to put up my Rolls Royce as security. And so the bank's presidents and all the officers got a good laugh out of the fact that she was putting up a $250,000 car for a $5,000 loan. So they gave her the money. She went on her way, and an employee, of course, took the keys and drove the car into the parking garage of the bank and set it aside. Well, two weeks later, the lady returned, and she was immediately ready to repay the loan. And so she handed the $5,000 in return and the interest that came to $152.61. And the loan officer said to her, ma'am, we're very happy to have had your business for these two weeks, and it's worked out very nicely, of course, but we're a bit puzzled. He said, uh, we, we checked you out, and, and you're a multimillionaire. What on earth did you need a, a $5,000 loan for? And she said, well, where else in New York City can I park my car for two weeks for only $152.61? Exactly. Smart lady, smart lady. Now your head's, like I said, has probably got to be swimming about that scripture before, let alone the one that was spoken before it from the Old Testament, the Jeremiah scripture. Um, it, it's weird because how is it that Jesus' Jesus's story praises a person for, for doing the uh, dishonest thing, covering for themselves by doing another dishonest thing? It's so disconcerting that it feels like one of those phrases that an editor may have slipped into the scripture way after Jesus had spoken it, and they were trying to make their own point rather than allowing Jesus just for Jesus to speak for himself. But I have to tell you, in all likelihood, it was Jesus speaking. So we are left with a little bit of sleuthing to do to make heads or tails of this whole thing. It's a story about people borrowing money. It's also a story of a person who manages those people's borrowing, and it is a story of a person who has the money to let others borrow. But first, let me go back to that first scripture. It says in that scripture, my joy is gone and my grief is upon me and my heart is sick Hark, the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? So it ends with a very familiar phrase, is no, there no balm in Gilead. So we're going to take that, that sentiment and we're going we're to throw it upon what was happening in the end uh, of the scripture that was, came out in uh, the book of Luke. Now, it's, it's interesting because I was reading a commentary about this because for most people, it's very confusing. You have to know what was going on in the time. And as I told the kids, this is really a story of a, a really bad landlord. And most landlords were really bad they would, of course, rent out to people, and then uh, they would charge them um, outrageous interest on the monies that they owed. And they would keep, of course, compounding that interest until people, of course, were enslaved. They were enslaved to their landlord. They, they couldn't get, find their way out of, out of debt. 
And of course, they'd do anything uh, to do it, to stay where they were, and of course, eke out more and more monies that they didn't have in the first place. And you know what that does. That, that encourages people then to find money in ways that probably were dishonest themselves. So I'm not certain what this manager did. It is said that somebody uh, alerted the, uh, the owner, the landlord, that this guy was was doing something dishonest or, or mismanaging his money. Now, I don't know exactly what it was. It doesn't say. But he got shrewd. Now, what did he do? He went to people and he said, well, how much do you owe? And somebody said, 100 bucks. Let's say 100 bucks. He said, OK, I want you to take that and make it 50, OK? And that's what you'll owe. And he went down the line to all of the accounts, and he basically cut them in half. So what do you think this guy was doing? How, what was he actually doing when he, he, he cut all of these bills in half? What was he actually doing? Cheryl, I hear you saying something back there. What, she, what was he doing? He was making friends, exactly. That's how you make friends for certain. But you remember, the landlord in the first place was enslaving them with outrageous interest, right? He kept on raising the price again and again. All the manager was doing was, in the first place, was going out and just charging the people for what they owed in the first place. So the landlord wasn't really losing anything other than perhaps in his mind and in his greed. And instead, the supposed dishonest manager was just making the books real. Which then, you know, it says in the scripture that he was to be praised for doing that. Okay? Even the master commended the dishonest manager for acting so shrewdly. For finding a way out of this problem. So, um, so you know, I, I don't know about you. <laughs> But I don't know if you're a landlord or if you are or found some, you ever were somebody who was in, in the place of, of uh, owing rent uh, and not being able to make it. I used to be a bill collector. I know about these things. Luckily, it wasn't about rent. Um, I was a bill collector for the May Company. Do you know the May Company was a, a clothing and, and appliance department store, right? And uh, I was one of, oh my gosh, in my room, there must have been a hundred of us, you know? And that was just for uh, the general Cleveland area. hundred of us, just for the Cleveland area, because they kept on throwing out uh, cheap credit like crazy, right? And of course, everybody knew that and would take advantage of it, and my job all day long was either, and they had different levels. They had people who, as soon as it went 60 days late, they'd have people uh, calling, and they were like bulldogs. Just get the money in. And if you would just get in 5% of what you owed on your bill, that would satisfy us for another month. 5%. You owed 100 bucks, bring in 5 bucks. And the outrageous bonuses that were paid to us if we reached a certain point where it was amazing, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it was, I'll be honest with you. The one time I made a thousand dollar bonus, you know, having people bring in five dollars. I doubt I brought in a thousand dollars. The deal was to keep them on the books, to keep them paying, and so that was the game. And so Jesus and was very much in the scripture was was actually trying, saying, if, if you would just level the playing field, all will be better. All will be well again. And so I, we find ourselves, perhaps, in that position ourselves in our lives. I don't think this only is something to do with money, although, let's face it, uh, Come on, folks, Jesus talked about money. <laughs> we should be talking about it all the time. We're going to talk about it after church today, by the way. And uh, 
it's not just, though, about the accounts of money. In my prayer today, I had you pray, you know, it's, I had you say, manage your accounts, O Lord, when we owe, nudge us to submit, when we are owed, temper our expectations. It's about living in a just and equitable world. And I'm not saying, well, if somebody owes you money and they just keep on not paying it, just don't worry about it. I'm not saying that. Everyone is due what they're owed. But we need to remember that, let's say, uh, somebody owes us an apology. Somebody owes us an amends. Somebody owes um, something that, you know, their pride is keeping them from uh, doing such a thing. You know, we can really use that situation at times as a hammer, as a club, to go after people. We can use it as power against them. And instead, what the problem is, is that we keep this cycle of anger or resentment or hatred going back and forth, just like a, a financial debt. You owed something, more is put onto it. You won't pay it, more is added on to it. It keeps on the back and the forth until it blossoms up to an impossible situation where nobody wins, you know? Where all of a sudden, the bill is so high, it's not being collected, they send it out to an agency. And then it gets really rough and it gets terrible. And the same thing happens with our personal relationships, with our national relationships. It gets so bad because none of us have the willingness to set aside maybe a little bit of pride and instead come to the center once again. Somebody's got to do it. And so Jesus is saying, you are that person. You are the one. I call upon you. Make the accounts reasonable once again. Stop making the accounts unreasonable to the point where repayment is absurd. That's really what our message is in that in this earlier scripture where it says, my joy is gone, my grief is upon me, and my heart is sick. Jesus and God are crying out, have been crying out for centuries upon centuries about the things that we do to one another, about the accounts that we make unpayable to one another. And that God looks down upon us and says, I want, I want you to repair. And God does send the balm of Gilead, this special soothing ointment of love and care. As long as we can care for ourselves and tear the resentment away from our own hearts long enough to allow our relationships to repair. Well, thanks be to God in all things that we do. And may you be blessed with this superpower because I believe it is a superpower to be able to let go, to be able to let God rule in our relationships so that we are no longer enslaved to resentment or to hatred or even to financial ruin. May God's grace be upon you this very day, my friends. I pray, I pray. So my friends, let us now sing. There's a balm in Gilead.